travelers along the path of the beam. I am known on this level of the tower mm -hmm, as Jaime and Fuego and if it please you join me here for a bit of palaver on HAIL to Stephen King or uh, Steve King in this case as he is all too often referred to in this book that I just felt insanely compelled to finally talk about here on my program that is hitting 140 episodes with this one. We are 10 away from the big 150. You can just call me Fuego for short, and I so very warmly welcome you to the horror show. So this is a show that I have been doing every terrifying Tuesday and every scarific Saturday for over a year, but this is technically the third season now of Hail to Stephen King. It started out as a once weekly show and it turned into twice a week as I was uh, nearing the finish line of reading everything Psy King the fiction published in order and it took me about eight years and it was an amazing journey that I encourage all of you if you feel even the slightest bit inclined to take the plunge y'all start on that path of the beam. But I'm gonna be dead honest with everybody. I bought this book when it originally came out in 2016, fall of 2016. And this is a nonfiction called Hearts in Suspension with essays by college classmates and friends. And when I'm gonna to be totally upfront and honest about it, and I think I've hinted at it a few times in various episodes, but um, when I first bought this, I read the King essay and I put it on the shelf. I I can't say that it's, it's okay, it's not Cy King's best like, essay, you know, uh, personal introduction, whatever. I mean, for me, that is honestly and will always be on writing. I find that immensely fascinating. And I, I did a whole nonfiction guide to Cy King's nonfiction stuff where I talked about Dance Macabre, I talked about Secret Windows, I talked about some of my favorite introductions and stuff that he's done, namely, like, Pet Cemetery. And shout out to Anthony from the Hail to Stephen King Facebook group for bringing up the terrific... Uh, just intro and pulling back the curtains that he did for, um, uh, where is it, up there, for uh, Silver Bullet. Uh, once the film was coming out, um, he gave just some insight about the creationary process and, uh, yes, just adapting Cycle of the Werewolf. So shout out to him. But uh, So when I was on my trip with Cecil and Susie from the channel here to Mad Monster, I, I was just in so much of this, you know, like reading guide, you know, whatever, nonfiction mode, I was like, you know, I think I'm finally going to go back and reread the Psy King, um, and look at it with fresh eyes. You know, reread his little. It's about 50 pages. His essay in here, and it's called uh, Five to One. It's in reference to one of my favorite Doors songs, uh, Five to One, One in Five. So I decided I wanted to take another look at that essay. And then uh, I wrote my essay in Denver, and I wrote my essay in Florida. He wrote me back. Hey, thanks for writing me essay. Um, but. I wanted to finally take a peek at the thoughts from his friends and colleagues and so on from college because I thought that it was just, it, it was about damn time, you know, something I'd put off for a while and, you know, anytime you have a long plane ride and you're just, because we were going from Arizona to North Carolina, you know, we had to change planes uh, in Houston and then change planes in Denver on our way to and from, shout out to Denver, Colorado, uh, but yeah, um, gotta say, I... My mind was blown reading this, legitimately, because, um, so you get this terrific introduction. I hadn't even read the introduction of this before. I'm being, like, super real with y'all. Um, King has an introduction, and I'd read that before, but I had not read the intro from Jim Bishop, who was an instructor of King's. Um, I'm trying to remember if he was, a, if he was writing or English, or, but... Anyway, he was only eight years older than King, and you know, King is 18, and he's starting, or he's about to turn 19, and that's another terrific... Uh, non-fiction, like, introduction forward type thing is, um, you know, it's about being 19 at the uh, beginning of the re-release of the, the Dark Tower of the Gunslinger. That one is fantastic. And that is just so much better of a, a look back at the age and everything than we get in this from King. It's not bad, but I just found so much more fascinating stuff coming from that instructor slash friend of his, Jim Bishop, 
um, and also from the people that see, there's former roommate stuff in here. There's you know people he worked with on like you know the the school paper and the you know student journal and stuff like that. So I found everything that those other people had to say in here, and it's funny because they all they all range from like couple thousand words to there was one in particular that uh, Jim Bishop because he was the editor of this that former instructor of King's he had to teach like this person submitted like 14,000 words and I had to like trim that shizzle down but you get a really good feel for King's college life in his thing but it is so much more interesting just getting the perspectives and the recollections from all of these other people not just about their their remembrances and their, you know, just their interactions with, with Steve, as they all call him. They all call him, I guess he went by Steve, you know, back then, Steve King. And so, yeah, just their thoughts and their outlook, and especially their looking back, is so immensely fascinating to see how King came across to people. You know, he's got this long hair, he's got this big ass beard, and you know, he's showing up to college as a Republican in 1966, but as the conflict in Vietnam is escalating and all of the counterculture stuff that he suddenly started to find himself just immersed within, starting college at such a crazy ass time in this country's history, I, I would contend one of the, probably the craziest since the Civil War, probably, and maybe, you know, the close third is like where we're at right now. Anyway, don't get me started on that. I'm not here to talk politics because I'm a registered independent, but it's just really, it's fascinating to hear from all these different people. Like Jim Bishop and his his impressions of uh, of King, you know, the, the instructor and the friend who basically hung out with a lot of the students because he was so much younger than the predominance of the other instructors. He's only eight years older than King, you know? And so they were both poets, they were both writers. They, you know, uh, they hung out at a lot of the same places. And like the, the recollections of everybody in here, I basically after a while started to feel like I was at college with King and I was getting to like, King mentions all these different people in his thing and then we get essays from those people. It's so cool, man. And you know, we get to know all of these different spots like, you know, the the Shamrock in this like pizza palace whatever place and the coffee house where all of the folk bands went and played. And I mean, you I started to just get familiarized with the lay of the land at the University of Maine uh, at Orono, you know, UMO as they all called it, just from reading this and from getting all of these. And it, it was just so cool to hear King like passingly mention a few people fondly. And then you get that person's perspective later on. Like, I mean, besides Jim Bishop, obviously being the one who edited this and put it together and how uh, he has the introduction and he has a fascinating essay at the very end. Um, so yeah, Echoes from Atlantis. And another cool thing is that um, you may or may not know, and for those who don't, Hearts in Atlantis, um, the book is not like the movie completely because there's a bunch of stories in the middle that we didn't see adapted. You know, everything's about Bobby, but you know, it's not, it's Bobby's story to a degree. You know, he's, he's one of the most recurred characters, but you know, um, we have a second story in it where uh, it's the title story, Hearts in Atlantis, because it's a collection of novellas. It's technically an anthology, but with all of these interlocking corresponding bits. And Jim Bishop actually got permission from Scribner to reprint Hearts in Atlantis and all of its 200, it's about 250 um, to, uh, pages glory. And that is about these kids who, uh, well, basically our main character, he gets to, and that's the one thing that I will admit did not reread here. I just stuck to the essays basically because I, I, I've read Hearts and Atlantis quite a few times, you know, both the entirety and uh, also the, the novella specifically. But, you know, you have our main character and he gets to, uh, he's basically first semester of college and gets uh, him and a bunch of his buddies, they, they uh, in his dorm, they lose sight of what they're supposed to be doing because they uh, they get addicted to playing hearts and apparently King played all these crazy variations of poker and he mentions one insane one that Jim Bishop came up with in here. So I, I did not reread the novella, I stuck specifically to all of the corresponding bits of the non-fictionalized, um, you know, like the real details of King's college life and stuff like that. And that's also mainly because later on this year, we're gonna be doing a reread 
of Hearts in Atlantis for Hail to Stephen King here uh, because it is actually celebrating its 20th anniversary later this year. So I'm very excited for that reread. So I thought I would just hold off and read all of the novellas in their corresponding sequential order. And uh, yes, but that's reprinted in here because it does really stand on its own as a fascinating tale. And really, it's, it's such a great version of King fictionalizing his uh, his you know initial impressions of being in college and oh boy there's funny stories in here where uh, you find out that all of the freshmen they had to they all had to wear these silly beanies every single time they were out in public or at least they were supposed to and so many just were de and didn't do it and stuff but they had to wear these beanies or they were at least supposed to every single time they were out in public on campus until the university, the, the UMO football team scored their first touchdown. And apparently that didn't happen for quite a while because they probably had a shizzy football team. But so Jim Bishop stuff is great. But um, the oh boy, Harold Crosby, Room 203 and Beyond. And this is the shortest one. And I believe if I remember from, you know, it's been like a week since I, since I was reading this on the plane and everything. But uh, Harold is the only one who did not actually... Um, like write his thing. He basically sat down with Jim Bishop, uh, King's instructor buddy, uh, who put the book together and was interviewed. And so they basically like transcribed his impressions. He was the only one that did not like was not in the King's circle for a lengthy period of time. You know, he was his roommate the very first semester and they had good interactions and he describes just how King would show him the stories he was working on. He describes the diligence that he applied to his craft with just sitting down and writing and showing his stories and all that other stuff. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just really fascinating to get that and the guy's kicking himself for not holding on to any of those and he became a dentist in uh, you know, like in a tranquil area of Maine and stuff. So that's cool. Um, you've got a couple of my other favorites. Um, boy, you get one, uh, Frank Caddy in the shadow of Mordor. Uh, he's the guy who took a very famous photo of King that I want to find in here, but I gotta, I gotta stall. But it's basically when King was writing his, uh, his column called, uh, boy, it was, uh, Stephen King, it was, uh, Steve King's garbage truck. I remember correctly and we actually get I'll get to those here in a little bit and there's reprintings of those in here yeah King's garbage truck but that it was all the rage on the main campus which was the the weekly um, it was the weekly school paper because there was the student literary magazine which was Ubris or who Ubris or you know whatever but they spelled it U-B-R-I-S and uh, that was what uh, Diane, a friend and fellow poet of King's, you know, she became the editor of. And that was where we saw initial publications of stuff like Night Surf and I believe Strawberry Spring, if I'm not mistaken. And so, but uh, Frank, the guy that I just mentioned who has that great Mordor, that little essay, King apparently, like he dragged him out a bed one day when King was super hungover and he was hungover a lot in college and even way thereafter. But check this out. Study, damn it! Hilarious, absolutely hilarious. That apparently appeared in the school paper, and you know, King was like, King had a, uh, he had a reputation. He had a notoriety as all of the different people in here talk about, you know, all of the different essays they mentioned that, you know, King, King was somebody who they were just, many people were very amused by. I mean, he spoke when all of the, you know, student protesting and stuff was going down, he spoke very heavily. Um, both in smaller groups and he even addressed like the entire student body a few times. There's some very, there's also a lot of vintage photos in here that have been reprinted. A few of them of King like talking to the student body, like I said. Um, you see um, these like sit-in protest things when this chemical company that was making the napalm uh, that was being used in Vietnam, you know, they were going to do interviews to hire more staff for this particular chemical company and the kids did a sit-in sit peaceful protest kind of thing. You see photos of that. You see, you see photos of, uh, so King's friend Diane, who, uh, uh, boy, she was part of this she was part of this uh, folk duo called Diane and Zoltan, <laughs> and they have a rad vintage flyer of those two. Yeah, super, super cool. And she also, and her, hers is another one of my absolute favorites. It's so fascinating. Um, what is hers called? I want to remember. Uh, by Diane McPherson. No, it's very simply titled. It's called Impressions, but um, 
hers is really she she talks about just you know the, the the crafting approach and how they were both poets and how they worked on you know these different collections one of which was called moth and it was the first place where king and his wife uh, then called tabitha spruce i believe um yeah first place any of their stuff got published and she talks about just the culture of the coffee house and all of the different places where the aspiring writers in college you know would sit down and get drunk and argue and it's just so fascinating man Damn it, I felt like I was there at college with King. It's so, 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 so good. And I mean, you get a couple other later roommates that were like King's big drinking buddies and that he tells stories earlier in his essay, uh, the, the five to one, you know, one in five, um, about uh, just some of their zany antics and, you know, sitting on top of roofs and, you know, you know, arguing about things and getting drunk and being cynics and all this other stuff. And just hearing the, the fervency with which Everybody talks about like the Kent State incident, talks about the assassination of all of these pivotal people like Martin Luther King, like, uh, you know, like, like Bobby Kennedy especially is one that really resonated with all of them and that is mentioned in I think pretty much every essay in here. Um, the discussion of the amazing music from mentions of CCR to ZZ Top to just, you know, all the things that, all the things that they were listening to at the time, I mean, and just reading at the time and just soaking up culturally and what a time to be transitioning into adulthood. And I am a firm believer that King obviously had legit ability and talent and all this other stuff, but and a great work ethic, obviously, too, to continue along with it, even because they talk about post-college King, even after graduating, and him trying their impressions of him trying to find teaching work and, you know, getting, getting shaved down and, you know, fancy looking so that, you know, he can actually get this job and you know fellow and there's there's other you know people in here who were making similar aspirations as far as trying to find student teaching work and things like that and it's just damn I if you're a fan of just King and fascinated by his life and just how how these formative years you know really went this is just such a damn good book everybody um Dave, yeah David Bright that's the other one that I wanted to mention because um he was King's first editor and he went on to, you know, be a writer and an editor for tons of papers in both Maine and all over the rest of the country. And his is called To Maine in Search of Life's Mission. And David Bright was an activist. He was, uh, he was the editor of the Maine campus, which is the school paper. And his is especially fascinating because it tracks just how King started writing this King's garbage truck thing. And uh, just how he just showed up in the office and he's like, I want to write a column. And they're like, okay, um, we'll let you, we'll let you do one, but it has to be delivered on time, promptly, every single week, you know, and we'll maintain it and everything has to be, it has to be able to fit in these margins and, you know, so on and so forth. And he talks about trying to, you know, find the budget and how they were somehow able to wrangle getting color because of the fact that they would print up the publication right after somebody else who was using color, but it would be a different, different like color uh, I guess theme every time and so one of their main buyers are advertisers I would say buyers of advertising space um, they would just give them forewarning about where uh, or excuse me what the color scheme is going to be and then uh, they would pick out a car of that color to feature the, like I love this kind of behind the scenes stuff legitimately it's why I still buy physical media you know, which was another argument that I saw recently on, it was either, it's either the Killer Flicks Facebook group or Hail to Stephen King. I, I can't recall. It was somewhere there. But people were going back and forth about, you know, e-readers versus physical, physical media and about just having, you know, uh, you know, digital downloads of films as opposed to, you know, rows and rows and rows of DVDs and Blu-rays and some VHS because I still have I, if you step into my, my uh, Casa in Fuego, uh, which uh, there's 19 in the number of my address, yeah, it's fascinating, right? I've been here for over six years. It's a weird number that always pops up in my life a lot of the time, too. But uh, you step into my home, and you immediately look to the right, and you see my large flat screen, and you see two ginormous, like about this size, two of them, one on each side, filled to the brim with Blu-rays and DVDs. And I previously gave a tour of my King-related DVDs and Blu-rays, but I've still never, maybe I should do that for my, my solo channel, my Infuegotainment channel, is give just a full tour of all of my DVDs and Blu-rays and the few VHS that I still have of things that have never been 
given a proper uh, high definition release or a you know proper DVD release. But I, I digress. I I love buying physical media because you get commentary tracks. You get um, and if, at least if you opt for you know proper special editions, and that's why Twilight Time and Screen Factory and places like that still get my money consistently because I like seeing a behind the scenes documentary. The one uh, about how The Endless was made, a terrific film from last year. One of the best that I've ever seen. I, and, uh, some of the only interesting things on the Dark Tower DVD are those uh, those behind the scenes things and certain interviews and stuff like that. And boy, I wish they would have. I wish they would have nailed it. But that's why I find something like this so intriguing. And you know, David Bright just talking further about King showing up at the same time every single week around. Like he had to have the story like in by noon. You know, every week on that same day. And so. He would show up around 11.30, he would sit down, and apparently King smoked like wherever the fudge he wanted to, and King actually admits in here, and I've never heard him admit this before. He's like, I haven't drank in blah, 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 X however many years since, you know, after the whole, uh, you know, step in during Tommy Knockers, which he actually takes another swipe at Tommy Knockers in here, which makes me sad, because I actually, I actually love Tommy Knockers. It's definitely overblown, but, um, he mentions that despite the fact that, um, you know, since he got sober and then you know, hasn't done drugs or, you know, drank or anything like that, cigarettes are his one vice he has never been able to completely give up. He says in here, I ration myself to three a day. So this is a few years ago that I heard, you know, that this came out. So who knows? That's, that's crazy. He talks about how uh, he smoked a particular brand because it was from some actor that he thought was cool and it was their brand and he'd smoke like a couple packs a day. I was very similar to that in my early 20s as well. I used to call myself the automatic man, like the Bad Religion song where he's like, he smokes three packs a day! Bad Religion, my favorite band. If you don't know about them, check them out. But yeah, David Bright's like, yeah, so King would show up and he was once again the editor of the main campus school newspaper. King would show up every week at about 11.30 and he would just sit down and he would just he would just crush his bit. He would just crush it and he would hand it over. No corrections, no whatevers. And remember, they're working on typewriters back then. You know, so that means his spelling, his punctuation, everything. And he's like, no, all of this stuff was always on point. No rewriting, whatever. So that means King, King would probably have some, a few things like bumping around in his head. And that's something else that somebody talks about here is, um, they mentioned that they understood King's working process of the fact that he would always have an, like, when he came to, you know, came to prominence, they're like, how is this guy turning over like a book a year, sometimes two books a year, just one after the other, after the other. And um, I'm trying to remember which essay it was in now, because that bums me out that I can't remember who specifically discussed it. And maybe it was David Bright, you know, but, uh, and you know what, now that I think about it, I'm pretty sure that it was because they're like, King would have a book in the planning stages, in the writing stages, in the editing stages, in the, in the uh, going to press stages. Like he would probably have in some form or another like four to five different books all being worked on to some varying pre-production or post-production degree all at once. And he's like, it was seeing that efficiency that impressed me so goddamn much about, uh, about Steve as they all referred to him back in the day. You can tell from my energy here that I really, really enjoyed the hell out of this. And now I totally remember why it was David Bright, his former, his first editor, as he mentions King uh, addressing him as at the very end of his essay. But uh, yeah, it's just funny because he's like, so for one particular day, we had to move his deadline up one day. It was the one and only time in the two in the couple of years that he did the column, you know, that uh, we threw him off. And apparently he was irate, pissed as fuck. And so, yeah, he said that King, that one and only day where they moved his deadline up one, that he stormed in and he was pissed and type, 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 rah, gets mad, throws it down, cussing, all this other stuff, getting infuriated. Again, ah, halfway through, mad, crumbles it up, throws it off. And he was like, it was then and there that I totally realized how, man, I mucked with his process massively. This man is on an efficient schedule of creation and self-expression. And he said that he felt legit bad about, you know, stepping, <laughs> stepping on King's toes and messing that stuff up. So that, that was a really, that was a really fascinating story. And so 
that's and and you know as I said, Diane McPherson's was great. I mean, all they're all so 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 damn good in here. And you know what? I actually think I want to do. I want to. I want to give you a taste of King's writing style for his King's garbage. So his King's garbage truck, and uh, let's let's find one. You know, I'll just do what became his final one. This is very fascinating. So once again, King's garbage truck. Let's give it a sec to autofocus. Maybe it's too bright. You don't know, man. I don't know. Red team, go. I've already been going for about 26 minutes, but let's let's wrap this shizzle up. So. Uh, King's Garbage Truck by Steve King. This is from May 21st, 1970, published in the main campus. A blessed question mark event announced to the University of Maine at Orono. Name, Steve King. Date of birth into the real world, June 5th, 1970. Age, 22. Weight, 207 pounds, 6 ounces. He went that low. Hair, black with dandruff threatening to get out of control any day. Eyes blue with beautiful red lines which are most clearly visible on Sunday morning. Political views, extremely radical, largely due to the fact that nobody seems to listen to you unless you threaten to shut them down, turn them off, or make some kind of trouble. Height, 6 feet 3 inches, and I didn't know they piled it that high either. Ah, oh, his, his wit is just there from the get-go. Complexion, hairy. Favorite color, blue, although during the last four years after the death of Robert Kennedy, the death of Martin Luther King, the death of Fred Hampton, the death of four young men and women at Kent State, the death of two black students at Jackson College, the death of 114 people at Mai Lai, the entrance of United States into Cambodia and Laos, after all these things, black in the form of armbands seems much more in vogue. Favorite president, none. Favorite university chancellor, none. Favorite films, they shoot horses, don't they? Bonnie and Clyde, MASH, The Wild Angels, Attack of the Giant Leeches, and The Ballad of Cable Hogue. Favorite newspaper, The Main Campus, The National Enquirer, ha! Uh, he listed two, that's great. Candidate for gutsiest faculty member, Joe Schimeka, Schimeka, yeah, there you go. Candidate for greatest student body members, Stan Cohen and Dave Bright, you see, he mentions his buddy Dave Bright, there you go. Favorite musical group, Creedence Clearwater Revival. Most hated musical group, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and Chicago. <laughs> and he mentions in his essay about how much he hates Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and now he wrote a review just destroying their most recent album that came out at the time, and how he had this other student like ready to fight him over it. But here's the last of it. Future prospects. Hazy, although either nuclear annihilation or environmental strangulation seem to be definite possibilities. This boy has shown evidence of some talent, although at this point it is impossible to tell if he is just a flash in the pan or if he has real possibilities. It seems obvious that he has learned a great deal at the University of Maine at Orono, although a great deal has contributed to a lessening of idealistic fervor rather than a heightening of that characteristic. If a speaker at his birth into the real world mentions changing the world with the bright-eyed vigor of youth, this young man is apt to flip him the bird and walk out as he does not feel very bright-eyed by this time. In fact, he feels about 2,000 years old. And one thing that a lot of people say here is that King, even in college, felt like an old soul to them. You know, he was aged beyond his years and obviously very talented beyond them as well. And here's the last of it. However, since this is the last column he expects to write before his birth into the real world on June 5th, he is asked if he may often, excuse me, he is asked if he may offer the following hits of advice to the general body public before driving his garbage truck off into the sunset. I offer them in the spirit with which they were given. Number one, live peace. Number two, love a neighbor today. And number three, if the establishment doesn't like it, then screw them. Take care, my friends. This is so good. So, so good. Uh, I'm getting the feels right now, for sure, for sure. Ah, so, if you're as much of a fan of Psy King as yours truly, and I know there are many CRs out there, uh, if you haven't given this a chance, I believe it's uh, available on Amazon or eBay or various places. I don't think it was really readily available in bookstores because it was actually published by the University of Maine Press or No Maine. Um, so we have un uh, excuse me we have umaine.edu/umpress 
slash uh, skbooks at maine.edu. Okay, well that's a very lengthy. Basically, I would imagine if you just search the University of Maine Press, um, you will be able to find out how to get a copy of this, but I ordered it a few years ago when it first came out from amazon.com. So, I've been Javier Fuego. This has been Wondrous Palaver with you, and uh, thanks for everybody who tuned in. This is probably not gonna be a heavily viewed video, but damn it, I hope it is, because this was all about why you need to read Stephen King, Hearts in Suspension. It's, it's just, it, it intrigued the hell out of me so massively, and I'm really kicking myself for taking so much time to actually pull that curtain back and hear more about the perspective of his friends, his roommates, his contemporaries, both poets and writers around the time. And uh, yes, terrific, terrific stuff. So you can find me on all social media sectors like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and the Utizzles. My personal channel, which I am in high gear, doing lots of new content about, including uh, reviews of all eight of the nominated best pictures from the recent Oscars. Um, also, I'm doing retro reviews of all the Star Wars movies, and I also do a weekly new film release as well, new or newer. I just put up a review of a fantastic film called Juliet Naked. No, it's not the name of a porno. It's from the same guy who wrote High Fidelity, and it's amazing. So please, Portifa y gracias. If you get the chance, go check out my personal channel, which uh, you can just search in Fuego Tainment on YouTube, or you can go to youtube.com slash I mean Fuego. But you're on the horror show, damn it. So if you haven't liked and shared and subscribed on this video or any of our previous stuff, we do two episodes a day at least. We like to consider ourselves the most uh, prolific horror YouTube channel. We're not the best. I mean, there's the Cody Leeches of the world. There's the there, there's the Lee McCoys. There's you know the the Brian Gattos. There, there's very, there's CPs. I mean, there's amazing people out there. The we urge all of you to check out Horror Addicts or another one. Those guys are great. Tuesday, I believe it is the fifth of March. We are going to be doing the journals of Eleanor Druce, not written by Cy King, but it is a preliminary primer for the Kingdom Hospital miniseries that I will be doing an anniversary review, the 15th anniversary of. And uh, yes, it's going to be a similar approach that I took with the storm of the century uh, just about a month ago, which is terrific as well. So I've been Fuego. Y'all have been amazing, and I'm gonna wrap this up now. So, until the wheel of Ka comes around once more, hasta luego, sin amigos, constant viewers and readers alike, I am hopeful that we get to reconnect sooner rather than later. Say thank you, and until that instance occurs, remember to stay scared. And read Stephen King's Hearts in Suspension. It is worth seeking out.